Welcome again on behalf of the American Psychological Foundation, and thank you for joining us for this APF at Home Fireside Chat. This is the second chat honoring the 2023 recipients of the APF Gold Medal Award for Impact in Psychology. I'm Dr. Melba Vasquez, APF president, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be here today with one of our recipients, Dr. Eduardo Salas. As a premier private grant-making foundation in psychology, APF awards over $1 million annually in grant scholarships and awards, supporting psychologists and students using psychology to address major issues and improve lives. APF is unique in that it receives the overwhelming majority of its funding from individuals like those of you joining us today. We cannot express enough our gratefulness and appreciation to your investment in APF and the important research we continue to fund. As we proceed through the conversation, if you have any questions for Dr. Salas, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will do our best to address all questions at the conclusion of the program. It is now my absolute pleasure to formally introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Eduardo Salas. With 40 years of experience in applying psychological science to teamwork, learning and development, and safety culture in complex and dynamic environments, Dr. Eduardo Salas has a proven track record and passion for developing evidence-based principles, guidance, tools, and interventions to improve teamwork, learning, and safety across a wide variety of contexts, such as aviation, oil and gas, military, emergency response, space exploration, as well as healthcare. Dr. Salas holds various prestigious titles and awards, including past president of the so Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology and the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. He's recognized as a fellow by the APA, the HFES, and Association for Psychological Science, and has received numerous honors for his work. Welcome, Dr. Salas. Thank you, Melva. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you again for joining us today. I'd like to jump right in to how you ended up where you are. Your career has been defined by an extensive, an extensive body of research that has significantly impacted the field of industrial and organizational psychology and team science. Could you share the journey that led you to focus on this area? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, like most of us, I start, it started in graduate school. I, w I went to uh, Old Dominion University to get my doctorate in IO psychology. And I took a class with one of my mentors uh, on team dynamics. And, and that class was almost at the end of uh, you know uh, uh, my tenure there. Um, and I got intrigued by it, uh, began to read about it and made a couple of presentations and uh, lucky enough, uh, I wanted to go back to Florida where I, I did my bachelor's and my master's and the Navy, the US um, Naval Training System Center was called at the time in Orlando, uh, hired me. And uh, the reason they hired me was to build, to develop a team training, team performance uh, research portfolio, a laboratory. Um, and so that's how it started. Uh, I worked for the Navy 15 years um, around team performance issues, teamwork, all, all, the, all those uh, topics. And uh, I was a one man operation in 1984, but by the time I left, there were 45, 50 PhDs uh, in IO, human factors, experimental studying team dynamics. Um, and then I went to, uh, I'm sorry, you grew it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, of, of course, uh, the military does everything in teams, right. Uh, and, and so there's a, a lot of interest in, in crews, groups, collectives. And so till today they have, um, uh, a, um, a division, uh, all, uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, 
continue to understand teamwork and, and those kind of things. And then I went to UCF, uh, University of Central Florida in Orlando. I was there 15 years. Uh, a whole new world opened, uh, which uh, we might talk later. And and then I came to Rice uh, in 2015. I'm uh, at, at Rice University, and um, uh, very quickly, you know, one of the reasons I came to Houston and Rice is um, one is uh, the Texas Medical Center across the street. Uh, you know. Uh, the largest uh, healthcare conglomerate, I think. Uh, and I do a lot of healthcare work. Um, oil and gas, it's uh, also here. Um, NASA, uh, and, you know, there, believe it or not, there are a lot of interesting team cohesion, teamwork uh, in NASA. So, you know, I'm, I'm here, continue to do the, thing, the same things that I started uh, about 40 years ago in grad school. Okay. Well, as, as I said earlier, and as you just said, you have an amazing array of research uh, that spans across areas. Um, uh, it, it seems as though it's beyond psychology, but it not only includes healthcare and leadership training, but unit cohesion, aviation, space flight, even more. Wh what are some of the challenges that you faced in bridging psychological research with the needs of all those different industries? Yeah. Uh, the first thing I learned in the Navy was that we needed to translate the science, uh, make it accessible to the people we were trying to help, uh, people we were trying to understand what they they were doing in a team. So, you know, I learned very quickly uh, to communicate in a way that they understood what I was trying to do. Uh, another challenge uh, when you do apply work, you know, in, in the field basically is getting access. You know, if you're going to study aviation teams uh, or, uh, um, or surgery teams, you know, you need to have the uh, access to the OR to observe them. You need to have access to the cockpit. Uh, you know, you need to have access to the oil rig. And so that's another challenge uh, when you apply work that not many industries um, open, you know, th their uh, environments uh, to study. But I've been lucky um, over the years that um, most of the places, not all the places I've I've been involved with, uh, they do open uh, open their ORs, open their cockpits, uh, and so forth. And the other challenge we have in, in, in our science is that if they open, uh, let's say, the, the, um, the operating room or an oil uh, rig, uh, then you have to worry about uh, how, how about the data that you collect. I mean, how robust is the data? You know, um, in in in, uh, in teams, you need the large uh, samples, right? Uh, and um, it's very difficult to in 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 apply settings to collect uh, large to have large ends uh, to do this. And, and and so, you know, I've learned also over the years to do research uh, with uh, you know rich what I call rich case studies, uh, you know, sometimes N1, um, uh, but you learn. So th those are the, the challenges, right? basically access. And, and once you get access, uh, how robust is the data you're going to collect uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, but I've been lucky. I mean, I've been able to go to all these places and uh, stuff like that. Well, that's a good segue to to the next question, which is actually asking you to expand on that because, I mean, not only the translation of your research, but the applicability, uh, applied research. Um, so one of the things that your nominators mentioned uh, for your award is your extensive scholarly impact. You have a remarkable volume of publications, citations, and awards. Despite your white hair, I think you're young. <laughs> <laughs> you have over 420 journal articles, two books, 32 edited books, three, 247 book chapters, and numerous presentations and invited talks. Your research has over 123,000 citations, 
and you have an impressive H index of 178. How on earth do you balance such an extensive <laughs> research output with real world applicability? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, you, you don't get to this point without the help, the support, the encouragement of a lot of people. And, you know, from colleagues to students, former students. And so I've been lucky uh, over, over the last 40 years to be surrounded by people who are smarter than me and write better than I do and, and are good collaborators. But uh, when I was working uh, for the Navy, you know, I, I didn't have the requirement to publish. I mean, I, I was, you know, a research psychologist uh, with no publish or perish um, demand on me. But once I learned that we were doing some nice things, some some impactful things with my colleagues who were all psychologists that, that were working with me in the Navy, we decided we need to tell the world what we're doing and maybe some, maybe they will benefit by it. And so in the Navy, we began to publish and publishing in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wide array of, of outlets. Some were very theoretical, some were very applied, some were very, uh, some were, were magazines, you know, where we just told the, told the world, this is what we found by studying, you know, teams in the cockpit. Um, and so I, I, we didn't have a plan, no, nothing systematic. We just wanted to tell the world what we're doing. And and then I, you know, I, I developed a, a passion for that. So I was able to, with my colleagues, till today, continue to to do that, um, to publish and. and the main, I think, if, if you were to ask me, so why you do that is, it's, it, you know, it sounds a, a simple answer. You know, I, I love what I do. <laughs> well, you know, that says a lot. Your love for it and your passion for yeah, it. Yeah, and, and, and so I love my profession. I like being a psychologist. I love being an industrial organizational psychologist, a human factor. I mean, so, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I tell you a quick story. So when I left the Navy. Uh, I became an academic and, and, you know, the first phone call I got it, it's literally the first phone call I got was from uh, the oil and gas industry and they wanted me to help them. And I said, I'm sorry, how do you, how did you get to me? Why me? And, and they said, you know, we Google and we found your name, your publications. So I, I, there, I learned also that, you know, publications are, uh, a great marketing tool, you know, yes. so that people get access to you, to your expertise. So that's right. They know what you do. Yes. Correct. Yes. Um, team effectiveness. You've talked a lot about working in teams and collaboration, but team effectiveness, training, and shared mental models are some of the key areas where your work has had a major impact. Could you share some of the real world applications or instances that stand out to you the most? where your research findings have directly influenced organizational practices or industry standards? Yeah, I, I, I'll give you a quick story about the shared mental model. So one of the things that happened was in the late 80s, while I was working for the Navy, um, some of maybe the audience might remember this, but um, in 1988, uh, I believe it was, uh, a, a U.S. naval cruiser shut down by mistake a uh, Iranian Airbus. Uh, uh, 200 plus innocent people die. Long story short, Congress said, how can we make this kind of mistake? Long story short, uh, they went to the Navy and said, you need to study team decision making under stress. And so in, in doing this kind of work, uh, this kind of, uh, and then so we launched into, into a big program trying to understand teamwork under stress. And one of the things we found in, in the simulations was that we were stressing uh, the command and control teams that we were studying. Again, this is all studying experts. Uh, we were finding that uh, under a lot of stress, tremendous workload, some teams were maintaining performance without talking to each other. We couldn't figure out how come under this stress, 
they're doing well and there's absolutely zero communication. So that's what got us to um, uh, uh, develop with the help of other uh, uh, colleagues, uh, the idea that of course they have a shared mental model. And when you have a shared mental model of what you need to do, the task, the mission, your teammates, then you anticipate the need of your teammates and you pass information to them without them requesting. So that why there was no communication. So uh, we published that and, and that led, you know, and today, you know, uh, team cognition and, it's, it's, and shared mental models is talked uh, in just about every industry um, that, that I'm involved. Um, so that's how, you know, we, we were able to, uh, to do that, um, uh, you know, and, um, and that led to other opportunities, but I can tell you that one of the most interesting, not interesting, the most rewarding experience I had actually was with the Navy, where we were de designing, we, where we design, develop, and deploy a, a air crew coordination training program, uh, basically team training for air crews. And the Navy told us you need to validate the So we were collecting data in different communities, helicopters, um, uh, firefighters, and, and, and transport uh, platforms. And we, so we were testing. It was a pilot test, right? And one day, uh, the, the commander where I was working on, with uh, gets a letter uh, addressed to me and says, you know, uh, in they had deployed and they, this was a helicopter crew chief with the, uh, the third seat in the helicopter when they're there. And the story in the letter says, um, my uh, pilot uh, had vertigo. Uh, and I remember from the training that you develop, the team training that you develop that, you know, everybody could participate, everybody needs to engage in the team activity. So I went into the cockpit and I was able to help and we were able to land without any any uh, any problems. So, uh, you know, basically it was, you know, our lives were safe. Thank you for the training. I mean, it was that kind of letter, very, wow. very touching and very rewarding. Uh, um, uh, and so yeah. that, that's a big motivator, right? I mean, uh, the industries that I work with are industries where high reliability of human performance is needed because if not, there's severe consequences. Makes uh, sense in people's lives. Uh -huh. Correct. Yeah, yes. That's, that's astounding. That's amazing. Well, an example of your impactful word is the development of the Team Steps program, which focused on improving communication and teamwork skills in healthcare. In healthcare, could you discuss how this program evolved and its impact on enhancing patient outcomes? Sure. So, this is something that maybe uh, you don't want to hear, uh, but uh, in 1999, the Institute of Medicine issued a report that basically said that at that time. 98,000 people die, died in the U.S. hospitals due to medical error. Well, um, in 2015, by the way, there's a, uh, another report came out and basically said, no, it's not 98,000, it's 250,000. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. And so in about 2001, 2002, the military, uh, the um, tri-service uh, healthcare system of the military, uh, with the uh, AHRQ, which is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, decided that they wanted to launch a team training program to try to reduce medical errors. And so I was lucky and they called me as an expert because at that time I had all the 15, 16 years of experience in the Navy. And of course, like I said, I, I had published and done all kinds of, I had a, a couple of books out on teamwork and so forth. Uh, and with a panel, of uh, organizational psychologists, uh, educational psychologists, subject matter experts. Uh, we launched in the designing this uh, uh, Team Steps uh, program. Uh, you know, Team Steps, for those of you who are listening, Team Steps with double P, you can Google it. It's one word, Team Steps, and you can download a free medical team training program. 
Mm -hmm. and, and so um, it, it was in 2002, 2003, where we launched this. And uh, the, the interesting things about this program was, is that, so we created an evidence-based program. So the evidence came from all the studies that we had done in, in the military and in, in other places. So this is an evidence program. It is free. Uh, so you again, you can download it. Uh, eight, eight, 10 hours of curriculum uh, with videos and everything. And it comes in Word. You can download it in Word. So you can edit, you can change things to, to your context. So um, today, I heard somebody say, you know, it, uh, teen step is using 70% of the U.S. hospitals. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been translated into Spanish, Chinese, um, and it's been adapted, uh, ad I mean, in many, many places. Um, so it's, it's an amazing story, right? And uh, a few years back in 2016, with my students, we did a meta-analysis of medical team training, and we found that hospitals that deploy teamwork training, medical team training program, versus those who did not, uh, two things happened. Medical errors were reduced and, and mortality was reduced. So we, uh, and then and since then other studies have come out that there's a connection that teamwork leads to saving lives in healthcare. So team says is a, an amazing story. I mean, I like, like I said, it, you can download it free and it's not only using healthcare, it's used in many other places because um, since you can change the words and adapt it, um, people have used it in many settings. And and so it's essentially a model of communication and teamwork building. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, um, it, it's um, it teaches you team leadership, structure, communication, closed loop communication, uh, it has uh, four or five um, core competencies that uh, um, maybe I should explain that the, the idea be behind Teamstead was that we will give an individual team-based competencies that can they can be transportable so that you can take to different kinds of teams that you have. So uh, th these are four or five um, core competencies that you can take to different kinds of teams and, and so forth. So um, a lot of people still use it today. I think in the military, by the way, I think it's mandatory uh, to go through team steps. Um, but most, all the hospitals that I uh, visited or that I uh, give talks to or that I um, interact with, um, they all have team steps uh, champions because if you go to you can be certified as a team step, I call it a master. Uh, and, and so uh, most hospitals use it. Uh, it's an incredible um, story of, uh, you know, uh, how people use it uh, and uh, apply it and, and it works. That must be very rewarding to know that it's making a difference like that. Yeah. You, you referred to this a while ago, your work with the U.S. Navy. Um, that also has been very influential, particularly in developing training strategies to mitigate stress effects on team decision making. Can you say a little bit more about those uh, findings from those military settings and how they integrate into other contexts? Yeah, so... Um... So the, the first thing we, we, we notice is that, you know, teamwork is a big uh, catalyst, I guess, or uh, for uh, uh, for avoiding errors. And also, um, when you have good teamwork under stress, you can absorb more stress if you have good teamwork, because you you know you can, you can somebody's going to back you up. Uh, you have a shared understanding, shared mental model of where you're going to go. And so within a number of strategies, uh, you know, cross training, uh, team leadership training, I'll explain those in a minute. Um, with it, um, uh, teamwork training, uh, the, the other thing that we did a, a bunch of studies was in um, uh, debriefing, right? Um, have a reflection, uh, a discussion uh, on what just happened and how can you change things and improve and actually 
debriefing is now used in many many industries, and it's a uh, the most part. I, I, the way I talked about it is the more is is a very simple yet powerful tool uh, to improve uh, teamwork, um, debriefing, reflection. Uh, we did also cross training. So uh, cross training basically means we, we, you know we don't want the, the nurse to replace to replace the surgeon, but we want uh, the nurse to know enough about what the surgeon needs and does so that um, he or she can pass information when they need it. Again, that's promoting the shared mental model idea. Mm -hmm. So all these techniques, all these tools, I would call principles that we found in the Navy over time have, have now, you see in that in healthcare and oil and gas, uh, in the nu nuclear power industry, uh, as well, uh, uh, I see it now in, uh, in, in the, for example, in the banking industry, the research analysts who are who work in teams, um, and in some of that, by the way, uh, is beginning to get into the um, into science teams. These are scientists, you know, who are trying to cure cancer, doing re research, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of interest in, in trying to apply what we know about the science of teamwork into the science teams to foster innovation, to foster um, creativity, uh, and those kind of things. You know, I'm going to ask a follow-up question because what it makes me wonder, um, you know, the U.S. society has a, a work ethos of individualistic uh orientation to work and in other things. And uh, I think women and some cultural groups are more collaborative in orientation. I, I wonder if you've had some pushback in uh, against this collaboration teamwork approach um, uh, oh. from people who were raised in that individualistic model. Um, uh, you, you bet, uh, healthcare, uh, uh, actually uh, aviation too. So I, I would, I, I tell you the story. I tell you, I tell the story to my students. In night, when I worked for the Navy, you know, I was going to all the facilities trying to promote that we were doing this research. I was thrown out of a meeting by uh, an admiral who told me, uh, "We don't need your kumbaya hot top um, work." Uh, in and my God, I mean, I was just starting. And so I said, well, my career is over. That was 1984, 85. But uh, so that was then. Now, completely different. Yeah. They love this. This generation is, is more collective. It, it's different. I mean, healthcare is the same thing. So in 1999, when I started doing these things, I would go to hospitals and they were talking about the science and what we know and things that you can use, uh, there was a lot of pushback, uh, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, from surgeons. Uh, from, I was going to say surgeons are the ones who are most like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's, that was 22 years ago, right? I Now I've, I, it's a lot less, a lot less, Amazing. but there's still a little pushback. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so when I go and give talks at, at, at all these hospitals uh, in healthcare systems uh, across the country, 20 years ago, the only ones that really loved this stuff was the nurses, by the way, yeah. and the anesthesiologists, and there was small communities. Mm -hmm. Today, it's a different world. And to, today, everybody, uh, no. but there's still pushback and, you know, um, and I, I, you know, I used uh, an analogy of why the difference between healthcare and aviation. In aviation, everybody is engaged these days. And the big difference is the pilots had to engage in understanding teamwork because when the airplane goes down, they go down with the airplane. Mm -hmm. In healthcare, the only one that goes down is the patient. Wow. So the hook up, the, the hook is, it, it, it's different in aviation that it is in healthcare, for example. And so um, 
it, it, it's, it, it's taking a little longer in healthcare to embrace all of this teamwork and, and, and how it benefits to reduce medical error and retention and some other benefits. But it's a lot better today than it was 20 years ago. And, um, and so I usually say my experience, at least uh, aviation took about 20, 25 years to change its culture. Yeah. Healthcare, if, if you count the IOM um, report as, uh, uh, you know, ground zero, if you will, uh, we're still in year 22 of this journey. And so mm -hmm. while I see a lot of progress uh, and a lot of more re receptivity to this kind of things, um, there's still a little pushback. Uh, how, how do you how do you persist? I mean, I, I, I can I can infer that your science helps you. You have proof that collaboration and teamwork makes a difference. But how else, how do you personally keep going when you have that pushback? You get thrown uh, out. Well, it, 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 that uh, turns me on when they throw me out. Uh, you know, I've learned. It. And so, indeed, you know, um, I, I've learned how to translate the science. And then I, you know, all of this, Maybe you don't want to hear this either. You know, healthcare is, is really it, it's 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 moved by money. Yeah, so you yeah. have to make a business case. Yeah. You know, so if 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 I'm gonna um, deploy uh, medical team training at, at X amount of dollars, what mm -hmm. what what is it that I'm gonna get in return? And, and a lot of these communities, not only healthcare, but you know, they always want to know what the you know ROI, return on investment. So I've also learned that um, despite, you know, the healthcare should be about improving people's health and in uh, aviation to be about transporting. I mean, all this kind of stuff at the end of the day is the CFO, the chief financial officers control the organizations mm -hmm. and they need to know it, it's, it's so they need to know the cost. So I've learned a little bit about translating costs. So I, I give a simple example. So in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2008, I did a meta-analysis of team training, overall meta-analysis. And I found that uh, team training in general across different kinds of tasks, different kinds of teams, boosts uh, team performance by 20%. So it occurred to me that maybe I could use that data to make a business case. So one, it occurred to me, uh, when I went to a hospital in, in some office, chief financial officer will say, you know, what is it that I'm going to get out of this? So I will say, I'm going to simplify this. How much money you set aside, set aside for litigation? Because <laughs> they all do. Yes. And let's say you say, oh, it's, you set aside 100 million. Well, you're going to save 20 million within training, 20% per boost in performance. At that point, we already understood each other. So you, you see, so I was able to, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but uh, to illustrate, but um, so I learned to do that, um, uh, uh, to translate, you, you know, you, you, ha you have, you know, psychological science has so much to offer yeah. uh, to all this uh, uh, in, we just need to translate more and then, uh, and then make the translation part of their strategy, part of what they do and how they see the world. And I, that's what I learned. Actually, I learned that in the Navy, by the way, because it, it, you know they would open their facilities once they knew that one, what we were doing, why we were doing it. And, uh, and they knew we could help them. You'd make a difference in many different ways, including the bottom line. Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Well, as we're talking, collaboration and mentorship seem central to your work. How do collaboration and mentorship play a role in not only shaping your research, but also in fostering the next generation of psychologists? Great question. Um, I cannot do this by myself. Uh, I have never, and actually, you know, 
uh, as you noted, I publish a lot, but you know, I don't, I, 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 I of all my publications, I think I only have one solo. <laughs> Uh, the rest is with collaborators, with former students, with current students, with uh, practitioners. And so um, I right. believe publication in, in psychological uh, you know, science is a team sport. I mean, you know, we, we have so much. And so, um, uh, so the students that I have uh, mentor, uh, they learn I hope how to translate. Uh, they learn how to uh, the, the value of impact. Uh, so I hope that most of uh, the training I give them is a scientist practitioner model. You use the science to influence practice, and you use practice to influence science. Uh, and and so uh, I think. Hopefully, my students who uh, I placed in non-academic places uh, know that, and the students who are working in academia do apply work also. So, uh, the simple answer is, boy, I, without them, without students, without collaborators, I don't think I'll be talking to you uh, because of or hadn't had this uh, award. Um, uh, again, I mean, it, it's. It takes a village to do this stuff. <laughs> well, you're, you're living your model of teamwork and, and well, collaboration. I mean, you know, yeah. you're living it, you're working it. That's what yeah. you do. Yeah, that's amazing. And it does influence the, the next generation. You're right. So giving, given the evolving nature of work environments and technology, what do you envision as a future of team science? What key areas do you think researchers should focus on? Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, well, uh, multi-team systems is, is an, uh, you know, MTSs or teams of teams. Um, because, um, you know, all the teams that I've described, uh, one way or the other, you know, most people now in the workplace, e even pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, you know, you work in different teams. So teams of teams is, is what we need to keep them. Uh, we cannot ignore technology, so... Work that I'm doing now is uh, human AI teaming, human and robot teaming. You know, um, where your teammate is a, either a robot, an algorithm, or AI, and we don't know much about that, um, especially the teaming side, right? Um, so uh, there's work. On, I, I think that this is uh, true in a lot of psychological work, measurement is a big issue also. You know, um, even though in the team science progress has been made, I think where we need to go is, and, and I think that technology will help us, that is to have really online, uh, basically moment to moment uh, capturing of, the, of, um, of, of data, team data that allow us to diagnose whether this team uh, is uh, lost, is it's, um, in the right track or not. So there's a lot of interest, for example, right now in bio uh, metrics, uh, you know, they wire team people, uh, uh, teammates and technology can collect, uh, fuse all this data and, and, and generate, uh, and generate um, a diagnosis, if you will. So there's data, there's research going on in that area. Uh, NASA, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned NASA, one of the reasons I, I like being in Houston and working at Rice. Um, you know, when, I'm going to say when, when we go to Mars, uh, um, we're going to send a team. You know, right now it's programmed for individuals and it's going to be a 30 month journey in a very confined environment. 10 months to get to Mars, they're going to work there, eight, nine, 10 months, and 10 months to come back. So, you know, most of the team work and uh, um, research we've done is, you know, even though in an applied setting is over hours at the most, we don't have this longitudinal data of, you know, months, years, when you are also in a confined environment, right? And so NASA is doing some research uh, right now along the, that. And, uh, 
we're doing that in simulations, uh, but you know, we need to learn more about team dynamics is this over time and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so those are the areas. Um, uh, no question that the pandemic uh, had changed the workplace, uh, you know, as we know. Um, so now we have hybrid teams. Some are virtual. Some of the members are virtual, some are not. And so most of the phone calls I get actually the, the people need help is in how do you deal with hybrid teams? How do you build trust? How do you build psychological safety and all those things? So this is the areas that uh, that we're hearing. So AI is, is a big one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those are amazing areas. Okay, so um, finally, something we've been discussing frequently at APF and of particular relevance to this award is impact. How would you define impact in psychology? Wow. <laughs> I, you, you, this is my answer to this. Because I, I think I thought about this. Uh, I don't think it's our publications. I don't think it's... Um, necessarily the findings. Because what we need to do is translate those findings, right? We need to, if we have meta-analysis and so forth, translate those findings and tell the world what they mean in a way that they, that we, this is the way I, uh, I see it, that we change people's mind about something. And so what I learned in the Navy is with all these translations is that when we translated our science, with the findings, evidence base, and we will tell a commander, this is what we know, this is what you need to do, and they would do it. That to me was impact. So impact. I define impact as changing people's mind about what they're doing, what they should be doing, and how they should be doing. And of course, we need to use uh, the information from the journals and, and the science, but at the end, it's a translation yes. of that. And and I think, for me, the most impact that at least I've had in my career is that, and it's kind of scary also, but I, I tell you, I mean, you know, is that we change people's mind. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's scary is now I have 40 years of experience now, so now I have to be careful what I say, because if I say, uh, I go to a hospital and I tell them, I want to simplify this, I think you need to move to the left. <laughs> they move to the left. And so- There's Some power yeah. in there. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the other thing I've, I've learned had to do with impact is I do a consumer reports approach to translations, by the way. So if I say we have Ford meta-analysis, they have shown that psychological safety uh, makes a difference. Then that's kind of like, you know, the full circle remembering cycle. And uh, sometimes I will say, well, there are three studies. And then I, I will say, well, for that, it's only one study. And finally, I will say, you know what? This is my experience. And so I was, you know, when I talk about these things, I have like a, 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 a pyramid, if you will, yeah. of how do I communicate the translation so that they understand, you know, hey, listen, this is just only a few studies. Mm -hmm. While here, well, we have five meta-analysis. I mean, this is, you know, yeah. and so, Part of the impact is, is using the science in a way that people perceive you're being transparent at what we know. Yes, yes, yes. We used to, years ago, we talked about giving psychology away and, and what you're more precise in saying we need to translate what we know and help people understand it in their work and in their lives so that it makes a difference. So it helps them change learn and grow and change and so on. Yeah, that's 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 a very good <laughs> description of impact. I agree with you. Well, thank you, Dr. Salas, for sharing your incredible experience with us. So before we turn to questions from our audience, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to share? Anything we haven't touched on that you want to add? Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, it, it's been fun uh, walking through, uh, you know, 40 years of doing this. And, and the only thing I hope, uh, at least the uh, people are listening is, you know, uh, when you love something and you love your profession, you love what you do and you have impact, 
my God, uh, it's very rewarding. Very and when rewarding. you have a and when you have a group of collaborators, students, and so forth that you know push you to do better, push you to uh, to keep going. Um, I've been blessed. That's very good. Very good. It's nice that you can feel that way at this stage in your career. It's wonderful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and look at the questions. Bethany, I, did, I don't know if you wanted to read them, if you want me to read them. I'll go ahead and read this first one. Uh, one attendee wants to know, have you worked with the government and what <laughs> and, and what recommendations do you have for the U.S. Congress? <laughs> Maybe take the first one first. Uh, have, have, well, uh, I'm, let me, I'm not too sure I, I understand it correctly. Work, have I worked? Well, when I was in the Navy, I worked, I was a, you know, civil servant, so I worked with the government. But um, uh, no, so the, since I left the Navy, uh, most of the uh, industries, agencies that I work with are, uh, are not government. It might be funded by the government, but not government. And to the second part uh, about Congress, oh boy, uh, have I, what can you tell the, you know, uh, let me translate that to academia a little bit because uh, I, I was chair of uh, my department here uh, for seven years and I, I, I will go to many universities. You know, one of the biggest problems in many in, the, in many settings like government, like academia is that people uh, lose the sense of collective. You know, uh, there's no collective goal. There's no collective effort to, you know, um, even though we, we have our own area, we own, uh, have our own ideologies and so forth, but we are the Congress, you know, we're the Department of Psychology and if there were more collective orientation, uh, better things will happen. So that, that sounds a little naive, a little, you know, um, but uh, at the end of the day, after all this uh, um, uh, experiences, you know, I go to some places where I say, man, if you only had a collective goal, you will be in a different place and you will feel different about what you're doing. The challenge is finding that collective goal, right? Yes, yes, yes. And it doesn't sound like they're making very good progress. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, need <you. laughs> they need you there. Okay. Are there any other questions from the audience? I don't. I don't see any other questions at no. this point. Um, let me see if anything comes up. Um, I think people have felt very um, uh, rewarded and satiated with your presentation. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I guess I don't see anything else coming in. So I believe that is our final uh, question from the audience. Thank you so much for making time to speak with all of us, Dr. Salas. It's an honor to learn more about you and to celebrate your commitment and your amazing impact. Uh, on the field of psychology uh, and all the applications that you've had in it. Congratulations again on your well-deserved gold medal. Okay, well, again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, don't miss out on the rest of our fireside chats resuming in March with Dr. Lenore Walker. Visit the events page on the APF website. We have a brand new website to register for this and other upcoming conversations. Thank you, and we wish all of you a safe and healthy 2024 from APF. Okay, there are a couple of more comments. Yeah. Let me miss them out. Um, uh, somebody, an anonymous, an anonymous person said, thank you, I'm gonna learn more about your work. Me too. Greetings <laughs> from down the road uh, in Galveston, Dr. Salas from Stephen Baines. Okay, all right. All right. Wonderful comments, all right. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.